Okay, if you could just go ahead and open up your Bibles to Exodus chapter 13. Appreciate it. And we'll go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. I'm sorry, um, Exodus chapter 12, not 13. I'm skipping ahead. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, I thank you for this night. Thank you for this time to gather together with family and friends and Lord, uh, people who are gathered together by the blood of Jesus Christ, Lord, that's uh, the true family. And I pray, Father, that as we open up your word, that you would take away any distractions, anything that would hinder us from receiving all it is that you have for us, Lord. We know that your word is going to perform that surgery because you say it, it, it will not come back void. So we thank you for that, Lord. We pray that you give us ears to hear and hearts to receive all it is that you have for us in Jesus' name. Amen. If you could go ahead and mute your phones, I appreciate it. All right, so this is a, a, a pinnacle part of scripture verses. As we're going into Exodus chapter 12, it's fitting, and it's always fitting to know, and it's exciting to know that the Holy Spirit is the one who's ordering all things here on this earth. That God's got a plan for us, and, and it's incredible. As we're going into Exodus chapter 12, we're seeing that uh, we are going into the Passover. And how fitting, since this week we'll be doing Palm Sunday, and then Easter is the following Sunday. So that's pretty incredible. I'm just going to go ahead and mute somebody who's not muted. <laughs> I don't know who yet, but we'll see. Just a second. All right, Steve, muting you. Uh, I got gotcha. you. You're done. Thank you so much. No problem. So, so um, Exodus chapter 12 is perfect timing of the Lord God Almighty, and that and that that He's always watching out for us. You know, we can think that. Things are chaotic. We were just talking before we started to study how the world is just in turmoil as we see, you know, Russia and we see all things going on with China and the economy and jobs and, and everything that, that's um, going on in, in lives right now with jobs and, and relationships and things like that. And yet the one thing that's always a steady, the one thing that's always a constant is the rock of Jesus Christ. He says when the storms come and they'll beat against the rock, we will stand. And those that build their house on sand, they'll, they'll collapse. So it's exciting to know that the Lord has ordered all things. And, and when you come to this place where we didn't plan this out, and yet we're hitting Exodus chapter 12 perfectly at the time of Easter, you know that that's ordained by God. So praise be to God. Um, and so as we go into Exodus chapter 12, we know that the, that the, the last plague has been warned um, to Pharaoh. And this is going to be the, the taking of the firstborn children and as we go into exodus chapter 12 verse 1 it says and the lord spake unto moses and aaron in the land of egypt saying verse 2 this month shall be unto you the beginning of months it shall be the first month of the year unto you you know as the lord gives us new beginnings the bible says that he makes all things new it's a good thing because sometimes don't we don't we say can i get a do-over can i get a mulligan can i try over you know you do things the wrong way and god's always given us a chance to do it again and in this case it's a it's a like i said a critical point not just in the time of hebrew and and the hebrew religion and the jewish people as they're getting ready to start a new chapter in life but as a world this is a foreshadow of things to come, of a new change that would come of a New Testament in the Bible through Jesus Christ. This Passover as he is the Passover lamb. And so as he's telling, talking to um, Moses he, and Aaron, he's telling them this is going to be the new time to start the calendar. And this is where the Hebrew calendar begins. It's in the, it's in the time frame of Aviv, if you will. And that Aviv is really a time frame. It means the springtime or, or specifically barley ripening. Remember when the hailstones were falling down in the plague, it was destroying the barley because it was in, it was in um, full bloom at this time. And so that's what this is. It's the first fruits also. It's, it's uh, been called another thing. The, the first month of the year uh, is Aviv in the Petuachin, uh, but it's also in the Hebrew calendar. Um, some people may, you may hear it as the month of Nisan, Nisan. And what that is, is really March, April time frame. Uh, again, in the book of Esther, it's, it talks about that. So if you see it, it, it means both. It's, it's, it's very similar. One's a period and one's more of a month. Um, but as we continue on our scripture verses, verse 3, it says of Exodus chapter 12, Speak ye unto the congregation of Israel, saying, The tenth day of the month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for the house. 
Now, according to Jewish tradition, this, this is a house is a, is a group of people that would be anywhere from 10 to 20 people. So if you only had uh, five people, then you would join with your neighbor who had five or 10 and you would have 15, you know, 10 or 15. So you would have one lamb for every 10 to 20 people. And that, that's what he's saying. We, and as we continue on, it says in verse five, the lamb shall be without blemish, a male the first year and shall take out of the sheep from it or from the goats so a lot of times you, you hear you or you hear in in the jewish times it didn't matter that the animals were so close that it didn't matter whether it was a goat or it was a lamb the purpose was the same it was a it was a temporary sacrifice or a foreshadow of things to come uh, we know later in scripture verses the bible talks about lambs and goats and how the Lord will separate them in the end times. This is talking from a spiritual sense. It's not talking about the literal physical animal. Um, in this case, it didn't matter whether it was a goat or it, whether it was a sheep. However, it does, it does speak to the, the, um, the type of animal it should be. Uh, again, according to Jewish traditions, they would never get a, a lamb or a goat that was younger than eight days. And I, I can't help but think that, you know, the Lord created the earth in seven days and, and six days and on the seventh day he rested. And then it was mature and ready. And I think that's in essence what it's talking about here. You don't want, you don't want just a newborn. You want one that's kind of started to grow and, and has developed enough at least so it's at least eight days old. And yet not old enough or not too old. It could not be over a year. And, and the reason that they would not want it over a year is this is when many of these animals would start to procreate. And, and, and start to start to have you know little lambs and, and little little goats and so there would be this time frame when when the Lord would say they're in their most innocent state and you know you think of the children that were trying to get to Jesus Christ and the disciples were trying to push him away and he said suffer the children to come unto me for such is the kingdom of heaven it's that innocence as we come as that pure faith of a child that's not been tainted yet from the world or jaded, who believes all things and hears all things, right? Like love and, 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 and understands God's, the God of impossibility and, and, and can do all things. And in heaven, that's how it's going to be is we'll be there with the God who's done all things, ordered all things, as we just said, and, and has done miraculous um, things to bring all people who believe on him unto him. And so here we go as, as we continue. We're talking about this story of God bringing his people unto him. That's really what this is all about, is the redemption of Israel to the Lord God Almighty. And there's, there's this, um, like I said, the type of animal that's going to be brought is we, we don't want to bring uh, a sheep or a goat that's lame or you know left over like it can't bear any children anymore so we'll get rid of that one and put them out the pasture you know and, and it reminds me of the woman with the two mites as we talked about that past this past sunday who's giving her tithes and jesus was watching and he was watching those that gave and he saw that the woman that gave her two mites even though it was only two mites it was everything she had she gave pureness holiness piety everything was set aside for god and that's really what this is representation of is the sacrifice is not to be just a leftover or to be a um, a overflow of what we have, but it's to be something that we say, you're first, God, and you're, you're mighty. And um, it says in actually Malachi chapter 1, verse 8, not to offer the blind or the lame or the sick to sacrifice. Also repeats that again in the Leviticus law in chapter 22, verse 19. Um, and 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, talks about the true and the only spotless lamb. You know, these lambs looked spotless. Everything appeared spotless. They were innocent. They looked. They didn't have any blemishes on them. But they weren't perfect. They were animals, and they had, they had flaws, and they had, they had all kinds of um, um, blemishes and things that might not have been seen. If you'd opened up their mouth, you might have seen there was a tarnished tooth or something. That would sometimes get by... Uh, the, the examination of these people that were picking out, but they picked out their very best. That's the point. But the true, in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19 says, but with the precious blood of Christ as the lamb without blemish or spot. So Jesus came and he had no blemish. He who, he who had no sin, he, he never failed in one point. And um, that's, that's really what this was a foreshadowing of and why it was so critical that we give our best. Because when we give our best, we're saying we're giving what God's given us, his very best, Christ. 
So as we continue on in verse 6 of chapter 12, it says, And you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month of the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel, and you shall kill it in the evening. Now this is, this is, you'd miss this if you didn't listen to this, what they're saying. I want the lamb, you to pick it out on the 10th day, but you're to keep it with you in your home, get to know it and become familiar with it until the 14th day. So for four days, you would keep this animal and get to know it and let it become part of the family and you would continue to examine it. There's two points here that the scriptures are trying to point out. Well, first and foremost is Christ came down and, and he who was 100% God became 100% man that he would understand that we could say we have a savior who understands the frailties of mankind. He, we got to know him. People got to know Jesus inside and out as he healed and, and he did all the, the commandments of the Father, so much so that he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, but you would know God if you know me. These animals, they would examine also, there's, there's not just a point of getting to know the animal. And it reminds me when I was a kid, my mom uh, is from the South, so bear with me, but uh, my, one of my favorite dishes was chicken and dumplings, and it was my birthday. So she went and they got a chicken, and I got to meet the chicken, and I got to pet the chicken, and I got to talk to the chicken, and I got to play with the chicken until it was time for dinner. And then my uncle grabbed the chicken and grabbed it by its head and spun it around until the body flew off. <laughs> and then the body's running around, and the head, she, he threw down on the ground, and the dog grabbed the head, and I could see the eyeball blinking. And I said, I don't think I'll be eating chicken and dumplings tonight. But because I got to know that chicken, and, I, and, I, and it meant something to me. It hurt me. I was like, there's no way I could eat this chicken and dumplings. Even though it was my favorite meal, I was not going to eat it. My second would be fried chicken. I don't care what she did with that chicken. I was not going to eat that chicken because I got to know it. And this is the point of a sacrifice. It's something that's meaningful to you. It's not something that's worthless. And, and, and when Christ came, he became meaningful to everybody here on this earth. He got to know. We want God to know us intimately. He even says he knocks on the hearts, on the, on the doors of our heart and that we will open up and that he and the Father will come in and sup or become one or become family with us. And so this is what Christ did. And what happened, what happened with his family? They rejected him completely. Kind of like everybody, when they killed that chicken, they could care less. They just wanted to eat it. <laughs> and it says... Um, that this is, this is, the time would be the 11th hour, or it would literally be around 3 o'clock uh, to 9 o'clock. And this is exactly the same time as when Jesus Christ was sacrificed on the cross. This is the time, again, of all these foreshadowings at Passover that the Jewish people celebrate every year, are that foretelling that they should know that this was their Messiah, Jesus Christ. And, and yet many are blinded, as the Lord says, until the fullness of the Gentiles are, have come in. And so they, they, they should have known this was Jesus, their, their Passover. And as we continue on, um, in verse 7, it says that, And they shall take the blood and strike it on the two posts and the upper door post of the house wherein they shall eat. It Whenever you think about it, what is the door to a house? It's the entrance to the house. The Bibles talk about the eyes being, you know, the window to the soul. But, but what is the real door? We just said Jesus knocks at the door of what? Our hearts. He desires our hearts. He desires to take his rightful place on the throne of our hearts. And he comes and he wants to purify our hearts. Even David in the Psalms prayed to the Lord, Lord, search my heart. Try my thoughts. See if there be any way wicked in me and lead me into the ways of everlasting. And we know the psalmist also says, Lord, give me, renew in me, a, uh, give me a new heart, renew in me a right spirit. To give us that heart of flesh, the, the Lord tells us to circumcise our hearts. In other words, your heart and hearts are not receiving me. Your doors are shut. Circumcise your heart, open it up. And what is this purifying that's talking about here? Well, there's only one thing that purifies, and that's the blood of a pure spotless lamb blood, but the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. 
So in order to take a, a stony heart or a sinful heart, and the Bible say it, says our hearts are wickedly deceitful above all things, who can know it? So we all know we have wicked hearts that require a covering, that require an atonement, that require a washing, that require a, a purifying, and that only can take place with the blood of the Lamb. And so this is the foreshadow of what's taking place as you paint the blood on both sides of the door and then paint it above, as it says, and, and some would say that it almost would represent the cross as they painted that blood across the top. It would drip down through. And, and, and as they entered into their home, what once was seemingly perfectly painted, but really was dirty, now was crimson red. And yet, as the Bible says, it, was, it would become white as snow or white as the lamb. And we know that Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 talks about that sealing of the Holy Spirit preparing our hearts, preparing our bodies, telling, telling uh, the angel of death to pass over us, we're God's kids. And so we're sealed as we have God's spirit. But then also we know that Hebrew, in, uh, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 21, Moses, it talks about in the Old Testament, would sprinkle the utensils or those things that the priests would use in the temple for the sacrifices with the blood of the lamb, with the bloods of the sacrifices. And it also for, talks about that, that Jesus, unlike Moses, who would who would atone or clean and wash the utensils of the temporary utensils here on earth, he entered into the holiest of holies in heaven and he did the sacrifice once and for all and he, and he spread his blood there in the heavens for all creation. And so there is a washing that takes place to prepare our hearts to be those vessels of God, those ministers of God, those priests of God here on this earth and to, and to make us pure and holy for the service of God. And that's what would happen here is they're putting it on the door. They're saying, these are my people. These are mine. Leave them alone as judgment passes over, as the wrath of God comes over. Leave them alone. We, as the children of God, who've received the blood of the Lamb, never have to worry about the wrath of God being poured upon us or judgment. Praise be to God. We are washed white as snow. And God looks at us not because of our righteousness, but because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice he's made. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, it says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red as crimson, they shall be as wool. So when we see the color of blood, we understand that the Lord uses that to make us white as snow and to make us like the lamb, which was sacrificed, white as wool. And we think of uh, in, in, in Revelations, if you read, it talks about the description of God. And as we look upon him, he has the white, woolly hair, and, <laughs> and, and it's pure. And, and, and even the robes would be white. He says he gives you a white robe. And, and so the blood is what washes us white as snow. And John chapter 6, verse uh, 54, it says, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink of his blood, you have no life in you. Whatsoever you eat of the flesh or drink of the blood, you have eternal life. And I will raise him up from the last day. And then we think, as it, as it continues on in verse 8 of Exodus chapter 12, and it says, And they shall eat the flesh in the night, and roast it with fire, with leavened bread, and bitter herbs, you shall eat it. And Matthew chapter 4 verse 4 tells us that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And as we're eating this, as they're eating this sacrifice, there's two things that are happening here. One is they're accepting the, the, the Lord's command of what he's called them to do, which is to eat the lamb. But it's also a foreshadowing of what we are called to do. At, and Jesus asked the disciples to do, as we just read in the Last Supper at the Passover, uh, just before he was crucified. And then it says in John chapter 1, verse 1, that Jesus in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And the word was God. So we know that as we eat the word, we're eating the bread of life. We're eating Christ. That's what it means is to let him become fully part of us. Um, and there's three things here that, that are taking place. We know that this whole act is an act of faith, isn't it? We're, we're, they're trusting God with this, what, what may seem ludicrous, what may seem crazy. I'm going to take... 
the, the animal's blood and put it on the doorpost and this is going to save us and then we're going to eat this and we're not going to enjoy our meal as, as we're going to read on it. We want to eat it quickly. We want to do everything super fast. I can't even really enjoy the lamb. And, and even the ways that he's asking them to prepare it in, in verse 8, he says that they're to do it with holy fire. They're to burn it. And when we think about the fire of the Lord that is the refining fire, it, it gets rid of any kind of impurities, any kind of bacteria or anything like that as you quickly flash. There's no, there's no time for it to sit on the shelf. There's no time for it to sit there like some butchers do and with hamburger and it gets dirty. No, you're cooking it quickly, very, very quickly. And then it talks and it consumes it in no time. But then he talks about the unleavened bread. Again, the holiness, speaking to the not to mix. God with the world, not to have the sins of Egypt anymore. You'll be you'll be leavened out. You'll be you'll be purified for me, and this bread will be without any sin. And and again, the last thing is that bitterness, the bitter herbs. When we when we um, think of Christ on the cross, and He's been given the gall or that bitterness in His mouth, and and sometimes receiving the word of God to the flesh can be bitter. It's sweet to our lips, but then when we start to apply it to our flesh, it can seem bitter because it's contrary to us. And Egypt was contrary to what God's will was and, and contrary to the people he'd chosen, the Israelites, to, to pull out. And this is why later he says not to be unequally yoked with, the, with those that are unbelievers because it's bitterness. And, and so there's this, there's this bitterness to, to remind them of where they've come from. And as we continue on in verse 9, it says, Eat now, of Exodus chapter 12, eat now, I'm sorry, eat not of it raw or sodden with water, but roasted with fire, with the heads and the legs, and with the pure, uh, puritans thereof. Again, everything that is acceptable to God not to be diluted. It's not to be raw where the life is still in it at all. And, and not to, we know Samson was told as, as a Nazarene vow to not touch any dead thing or any, anything that's, that's alive. But also later we know, that, we know that the power of the blood is the life. As, as um, Cain and Abel, and, and Cain had killed Abel, and Abel's in the ground, and God says, your brother's blood cries out to me. So this is life. So he says, you're not to leave any life left in this. This is to be a dead animal. This is to be completely dead, completely cooked, and by the way, don't dilute it. Don't boil it away, all the nutrients. No, I want you to eat it quickly. There's no time to be boiling it. I want you to burn this fast. And the urgency that's being spoken of here, it, it's, this is kind of coming to a head of the message that's happening here. Death is coming. It's imminent. And the wrath of God is coming. This act that I want you to do, I want you to do quickly. And I want you to do this uh, in pureness. In verse 10, it goes on and says, And ye shall... Let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning shall be burned with fire. Again, this is reminding us of the provision of God that he's about to, he's telling them in advance or foreshadowing how he would feed them in the wilderness through the manna, which would drop from heaven, and they would collect it for the day, they would eat for the day, but they wouldn't save it for tomorrow, for if they saved it for tomorrow, it would be filled with worms, it would be no good. And so what he's saying is, what I give you, consume completely now. Today is the day that we're to receive all of Christ, not some of Christ. We're not to take parts of the scriptures and, and only take what we like, but no, we're to take it in its fullness and eat it and consume it all and to receive it um, with joy each day. You know, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. We're guaranteed today. So we want to take the fullness of each day that God's given us. And so that's what he's saying. Eat, eat this in the fullness thereof. And then verse 11 goes on, and he says, And thus shall you eat with your loins girded, and your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat with haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Lots packed into this verse. Let's take it apart a little bit. It says, You shall eat it. Commandment. Do as I say. Just as Christ says, you must eat of my body, you must drink of my blood. It's not a continual perpetual consumption. It's not cannibalization. It's literally receiving into you all that is God. It's literally believing with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and worshiping the Lord thy God. And so that's what he's talking about, receiving and belief. And eat this lamb with total faith as, it, as, as Moses is boasted on for doing this very act 
in the hall of faith of, of Hebrews chapter 11. It talks about him doing this. This is a faithful act. And then he goes on and says, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. What is he saying there? He's saying, normally these people in this area would have sandals, they may sit down. If you remember, Jesus would even wash the feet of people as they come in and they'd sup, and it would be a, a very intimate time. It would be a time of fellowship and camaraderie and sharing, sometimes sharing a little too much as they would have a stew pot in the middle and everyone would be dunking their bread in and double dipping and triple dipping and quadruple dipping. Um, you know, things that we, we think are not, you never do nowadays. <laughs> we don't want to swap leftovers, if you will. But that was an intimate time. This is not a time for intimacy. This is a time of urgency. This is a time of doing this quickly. You're to, you're to, you're to have your, your, um, your loins girded. In other words, they would take these, these pieces of loincloths, and when it was time to run, they would fold them up so they could run quickly. Not like some of these guys I see in the city with their pants down and, and their underwear are showing. I'm like, man, what happens if something happens and they gotta go? <laughs> They're gonna have to hold on to that and run and fall down and no, that you wanna prepare, you wanna gird up your loins, he's telling them. And then the second thing is he's saying to, to have your shoes on, tie, not your shoelaces off to the side, straggling, no. Be ready to go, get ready, people get ready. You know, Jesus is coming. Your redemption draws near. He's saying this is the time to be ready and look up. All these things have come to pass that were going to come to pass. I've told you that, that the last judgment is coming upon Pharaoh and he will release you. And when he releases you, we're going to move. We got to go. And then the final thing is he tells them to, to, to have their staff. And obviously we know that the staff is there for walking. It's, it's there to help them move, to get... The, 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 the elderly and, and those that are in charge to help protect, but to get moving, these are these, they bring, bring your staff with you. And we know the staff is even more critical when it comes to Aaron and Moses because that's what God used to show the power of God as he turned it into a serpent and then brought everything that was crooked back to straight and made it holy again to take that snake and grab it by the tail and make it a, a, a staff, make it straight. So it's the rod of correction. Bring, bring this with you. Be ready to move. Have this with you. And I, it reminds me of Psalm 23 where the, where, where the Lord leads us beside still waters. He leads us through the valley of the shadow of death. And thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. He's taking them on a journey. He's taking them to meet where they can, they can be near still waters and they can eat and they can prosper. A land flow, filled with you know, honey and milk and honey and, and so many blessings. And as we now look for that journey through this world urgently, seizing the moment, seizing the time. And I think in, in the world that we live in right now, never has it been um, more critical or never has there, should there be more urgency in our hearts to look up that our redemption draws near, that Jesus is coming back. The world has kind of gone bazonko, you know, gone crazy. And, and Satan, the author of Confusion, is all over the place and, and stirring up things and stirring up trouble, setting up his, his um, fake kingdom. And the, it's time for us to look up. And in the Bible, it also, Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven and, and how there are ten virgins. And, and he says that, that, that five have their lamps filled, they're ready, and the other five don't. And when Christ comes, they, they ask the five that don't have, ask the ones that do have, and they say, go get your own. We only have enough for us. They're ready. They're ready to go. They're waiting for the Lord. Um, the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter um, 4, verse 2, to be instant in season and out of season, always ready to give an answer, to give, give people uh, for the hope that lies within us. And, and um, this, is, this is the message today, guys, is... It's an incredible foreshadowing. God has ordained everything. This, this Passover is a full testimony of what we're entering, entering into and a perfect um, foreshadowing of the next two weeks of Sunday service that we'll be going into with some, Palm Sunday and then into the, the resurrection celebration. This is a, a time for us to not be playing games, but, to, but where there's leaven, to get rid of leaven. Where, there's, where, we're, where we're lax and where we're playing and we're goofing off, to get serious, that the Lord is coming back. Prepare yourselves for the coming of the Lord. It, it's just a matter of time. I know that there's always people saying all this stuff, but the Bible tells us that a wicked and perverse generation is looking for that sign, but also says that the Lord delayeth his coming. You know, things are just as they were always from the beginning. No, they're not. And, 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 and Pharaoh should know this. He's been warned multiple times. 
and, and a horrific act is going to come as the wrath of God is poured out upon Pharaoh in our next week's um, study. Uh, it, it, the same thing's happening in the end times now. The warning's out there. God's wrath is, is being held back so that people will come to salvation. He desires none to perish, but all to come to repentance. There's no reason we can't receive the blood of the Lamb and put it on the doorposts of our hearts, even today. If you don't know Jesus Christ, please contact you know me. Let me know. I'll lead you into the salvation message. There's people now that are that are hungry for the Lord that are out there. Use, use this opportunity to, to invite people to church the next couple weeks. Um, and, and let's see what the Lord's going to do in hearts and minds and souls um, through his power, through his spirit. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. But dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this night. I thank you for each and every person who's heard this message. I pray that it would be received by the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, that our spirits would bear witness with yours that you're true and that you are the, the Passover, as it just said in the scripture. You are the, the, the pure spotless lamb. Just as Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac, you said, I will make myself a sacrifice. And you did, Lord. I pray, Father, that you would help us to not just see you as that pure spotless lamb that's been sacrificed, but also as the mighty lamb mentioned in Revelation who takes the scroll because you were worthy. I thank you for this day. I pray that we would be on fire for you. Um, help, us to, help us to get busy about your business. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.